good morning. This is Gary Greenswag, and uh, welcome uh, to our uh, Grand Rounds and Clinical Update this morning on management strategies in heart failure. Uh, I would say that um, uh, February 2nd was National Wear Red Day, and on that day, uh, we had the first in a series of three uh, for uh, the management of congestive heart failure. Uh, and it is timely as well because February is American Heart Month. So we are very happy to have um, uh, our two speakers uh, and uh, two additional panelists with us this morning. Uh, first, Dr. Selma Mohammed um, is an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist, clinical research researcher and associate professor at the Creighton University School of Medicine in Omaha, Nebraska, in the Omaha campus. Uh, Dr. Uh, Baikim Bozkurt um, is uh, the senior dean of faculty at the Baylor College of Medicine and as well the Marion Gordon Kane chair and professor of medicine. Uh, she is an advanced heart failure and cardiac transplant cardiologist with, an, with active participation in clinical practice, research, and education. And Dr. Jessica Brown has also joined us this morning. She joined the Woodlands North Houston Heart Center in August of 2016, and is a board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, echocardiology, nuclear cardiology, and advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology. And Dr. Uh, Nicholas Diakos, uh, who was with us on February 2nd uh, to talk about heart failure as an interventional cardiologist with a specialty in heart failure at the Texas Heart Institute, who is pioneering new treatments and devices. He is recognized for his subclinical, substantial clinical and translational research accomplishments in areas of heart failure and mechanical cardiac support. And Dr. Boskert, I think we are starting with you. Thank you, Dr. Granswijk, for this introduction. I will uh, go over the current management strategies in heart failure, especially in heart failure with reduced EF. This is my disclosure slide. I would like to first start by the universal definition of heart failure in 2021. As a consensus statement, we have formulated a standard definition for heart failure, which I would like to share with our clinicians, which defines heart failure as a syndrome of symptoms and signs, which all clinicians are aware of. But now there is specificity by recognition of these symptoms and signs being attributable to cardiac functional or structural abnormality and corroborated by an objective, either marker such as a biomarker with NT-proBNP or objective evidence of elevated cardiac filling pressures, either non-invasively by echocardiography or other imaging or invasively by right heart catheterization. This concept is going to be important and repeated throughout the guidelines, which I will um, cover in the next minute or so. Important concepts that I'd like to share, we're seeing an adverse trend in outcomes in heart failure. If one were to examine what's happening both to the epidemiology, the prevalence, as well as mortality and hospitalizations, all of these are rising. Despite all of the guideline directed therapies that have been proven to improve outcomes. So this is a quite a concern, especially in the United States since 2012 we are losing the fight against the heart failure mortality. The mortality is rising and the lifetime attributable risk of heart failure, as you see on the left side, has increased, has increased. And this is concerning, especially for populations um, that have um, poor access to healthcare and with healthcare inequities. Shown on the left slide, we're seeing mortality increases not only in older populations, but in younger ages between 35 and 64, as seen on the left and the right, but more amongst Black individuals and individuals li living in rural communities. And with these in mind, please do keep in mind that we do have a variety of new treatment strategies that have been shown to improve outcomes. So it's more important than ever to treat heart failure. And in the guidelines, we approach the recommendations according to the ejection fraction phenotypes. Reduce EF, EF less than 40, mild reduce EF, EF between 41 and 49, 
preserved EF, EF exceeding that of 50%, these two, mildly reduced and preserved EF, will be covered by Dr. Mohammed. And also keep in mind, we're also looking at the trajectory of EF as to whether this is improving or remaining the same. Those improved EF is not recovered, but in essence is seen as a specific category that requires continuation of therapies. For heart failure with reduced EF, we recommend across all guidelines, European as well as US guidelines, initiation of four classes of medications. What are those four classes? Renangiotensin inhibitors, which is the first class, either with ARNI, angiotensin receptor neprilizin inhibition, so cubital valsartan, or ACE inhibitor, or ARB if ACE intolerant. ARNI in NYHA class two to three, ACE inhibitors in NYHA class two to four. So that's one class. The second class is sodium glucose cotransporter two inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors. Third class, which is we are very familiar with this, is beta blockers. Fourth class is mineral cortical receptor antagonists, MRA. These four quadruple therapy is seen as step one. All of the patients with reduced EF should be initiated on these. Important concepts, time is of essence. If you look at the separation of curves on outcomes, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, the, the separation of the curves happen early, within 30 days. So the, the optimization of th therapies cannot be delayed. This is very similar to cancer therapy because this is a deadly disease. These are safe therapies when compared against either the comparator in the setting of ARNI studies when compared against ACE inhibitors or ARB, or when compared against placebo with SGLT2 inhibitors. In these populations, these therapies are safe. We actually have a safer profile with ARNI against ACE inhibitors for potassium, as well as kidney function, but a slightly higher risk of hypotension. In the setting of SGLT2 inhibition, no increased risk of hypoglycemia, regardless of diabetes status, no excess risk of volume depletion, ketoacidosis, electrolyte abnormality, and more importantly, both of these newer agents are associated with kidney protective effects. They do result in the long-term uh, uh, slowing of the decline in EGFR. Initially, after initiation with RAS inhibition, as well as SGLT2 inhibition, there may be a slight bump in creatinine, which is not acute kidney injury or worsening of renal function. In essence, that is a reflection of reduction of glomerular hypertension that is commonly seen in heart failure is not to be alarmed about and the therapy needing to be continued because in the long run, SGLT2 inhibition especially have been associated with prevention of kidney failure. As I mentioned, heart failure is as malignant as cancer. The survival rates are comparable to colorectal cancer in men seen on left and ovarian cancer in women seen on the right. And therefore, I use the analogy of starting this quadruple therapy similar to induction chemotherapy in cancer. We recommend initiation of these medications according to patient specifics, etiology, comorbidities, ability to tolerate. Certain patients may tolerate initiation of all four at the same time, but we do recognize not everybody will be able to tolerate this. And these therapies can be individualized, but keep in mind, we expect optimization of quadruple therapy within six weeks. One can start all four at the same time for those who can tolerate. You could start two at the other two. You could start three at the other one. Permutations differ. And as long as it's optimized within the first four to six weeks, I think this would comply with the current guidelines. The second step is two titrate to the optimal doses. These are especially important for ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. We do have evidence that these agents are associated with improvement in EF and volumes and improvement in sudden cardiac death. So before device considerations, the medications should be on board and the doses should be optimized. The types of models of care are evolving. We have evolved from face-to-face -face visits to virtual care, to hybrid models, to remote monitoring, all of which are great. And we now have evidence of safety, of rapid up titration of these medications within two weeks of discharge from a hospitalization as shown in a recent clinical trial. And keep in mind, 
the new agents such as SGLT2 inhibitors and ARNI enable up, uh, initiation of other agents such as MRA because of their safety profile on potassium and creatinine. And we are potentially now in an era of where the patients may be able to self-titrate their medication with digital or remote monitoring systems. These are being incorporated in the system. The next step is consideration or initiation of hydralazine nitrates in black patients, and then considering the patient for device therapy, such as ICD, CRT, the recommendations for which have not changed, and add-on therapies. It's critical to recognize as those individuals with persistent symptoms are active heart failure. This is like active cancer. Just starting the quadruple may not be enough because there is still residual risk as shown with the red shading on this slide. If you look at the background medications of uh, heart failure with reducing uh, ejection fraction um, in this trial of Emperor Reduce, their background medications were quite good. But if you look at their risk, it was quite high. Therefore, we recommend a condition, uh, consideration of add-on therapies such as Ivabradine for those individuals with elevated heart rate, exceeding that of 70 beats per minute as a class 2A, or other agents such as Verisiguat or Digoxin as a class 2B recommendation as an add-on therapy. We also recommend or consideration of the potassium binders in individuals who have hyperkalemia. Other treatment modalities are also important. Yes, we have to address ischemia in individuals who have severe functional mitral regurgitation due to heart failure with the suitable anatomy, transcatheter H to H mitral valve repair can be considered after optimization of guideline directed therapies. So I consider these additional therapies as consolidation therapy after the induction therapy. So keep in mind, the, the journey of a heart failure patient requires optimization unless we reverse the trajectory and the patient totally becomes asymptomatic. We recommend initiation of GDMT, guideline-directed medical therapy, during the hospitalization if the patient has not been on therapy and continuation of GDMT during the hospitalization if they've been on therapy and not stopping the therapy, not stopping the therapy during hospitalization due to a bump in creatinine, due to a transient drop in blood pressure. These terminologies of acute kidney injury are not appropriate and individuals should be continued on therapies and the patients should be optimized immediately following the hospitalization for advanced Heart failure patients, those individuals with recurrent hospitalization, those individuals who may not be tolerating the GDMT, those individuals with advanced symptoms, we recommend referral to specialty centers and consideration of advanced therapies such as mechanical circulatory support and transplant. Final two comments, pre-heart failure and uh, asymptomatic phases are also important because we're trying to move the trajectory for early recognition. There are studies demonstrating that we can prevent heart failure, especially in patients with diabetes, as shown on this slide, SGLT2 inhibitors. When given in individuals with diabetes and cardiovascular risk, prevents heart failure. And this is now in the guidelines saying in individuals at risk with cardiovascular disease or with established cardiovascular disease, in patients with diabetes, SGLT2 inhibitors are indicated to prevent heart failure. We now are also recognizing there are other agents such as non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists when given in to individuals with diabetes and chronic kidney disease or microalbuminuria. These agents prevent heart failure. So prevention of heart failure now is being recognized in individuals with risk, in individuals with clusters of risk. And it is important to recognize who is at high risk for heart failure. Keep in mind, we have stages of heart failure. And stage A is those individuals without symptom signs or history of heart failure, those individuals with risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, obesity. These are population attributable risk at the individual level. Uh, individuals who have received cardiotoxic agents such as chemotherapy or genetic cardiomyopathies, these individuals are stage A. These individuals need to be closely followed and screened. In the, guide, in the guidelines for screening, we have specific recommendations. As you could see, we recommend, as a class 2A recommendation, screening with 
natriuretic peptides. This is from a study that screened the patients with risk factors annually with nat um, uh, natriuretic peptides. And if the levels were elevated, close follow-up resulted in prevention of heart failure. In the guidelines, we state that for those who are at risk, screening strategies with natural peptide levels can prevent heart failure. So in the US guidelines, we have recommendations according to stages. This is a busy slide. I just want you to recognize that we have specific recommendations for treatment and prevention of risk at stage A for those who are at risk. Treatment of stage B, now recognizing that these individuals are without symptoms or signs, but with either structural or functional or biomarker abnormality that requires them to be treated with heart failure spe specific prevention strategies, and then the stage C and D. Final comment, comorbidities require specific treatment strategies. Iron deficiency with or without anemia is recommended to be treated with IV iron, not PO iron in heart failure, is associated with improvement in symptoms, quality of life, functional capacity. Atrial fibrillation, which is an important cause and contributor for worsening of heart failure now in the most recent um, AHA guidelines is recognized as an important concept to be treated appropriately. And of course, a variety of other uh, etiologies require risk coordination and treatment. And I will finalize by stating that the concept of treatment of heart failure is very similar to cancer. Time is of essence with induction, with the quadruple therapy, add-on therapies for heart failure with reduced EF is important to optimize. And then treatment of comorbidities are important for us to move the needle towards earlier stages. And I'll stop sharing and I'll ask um, my colleague, Dr. Mohammed, to uh, present on heart failure my with mildly reduced and preserved EF. All right. Thank you very much. Super excited to be here today and talk about heart failure with preserved and mildly reduced ejection fraction. I have no disclosures. The objectives are to focus on pharmacologic therapies for heart failure with mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction and optimal use in specific patient population and to identify how improvement in medical therapy influences patient outcomes, including hospitalizations and mortality. So front and center to the care for heart failure with preserved mildly reduced ejection fraction is primary care. Uh, it is an interdisciplinary uh, team that also includes heart failure cardiologists, general cardiologists, as well as subspecialty cardiologists and other disciplines, including pulmonary, endocrine, et cetera. All right, so pharmacologic treatment, Diuretics are class one indication for patients with heart failure and mild reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction to alleviate symptoms and signs. So if patients are congested, they have to be diuresed to achieve optivolemia. Next, we'll talk about different classes of GDMT. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs have been extensively studied in large trials in heart failure with mild reduced or preserved ejection fraction. C3 trials have shown no benefit in outcomes compared with placebo. Uh, however, some Subgroup analysis have shown that if you look at mild reduce versus preserved ejection fraction, the mild reduce EF heart failure tends to derive benefit from ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but this remains boss hog analysis. What about mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists in heart failure with preserved ejection fractions? So a TOFCAT trial is a landmark trial that included over 3,000 patients with LVF more than or equal 45%. And the primary endpoint was a composite of heart failure hospitalizations or CV mortality. And similarly to the previous trials, it showed no benefit for the primary composite for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there were favorable benefits for the secondary outcome of heart failure hospitalization. Uh, there was a lot of controversy regarding the TOPCAT trial because there were geographic variations whereby patients 
in the Americas have benefited, whereas patients in the Russia and Georgia, they tended to have a different subtype and they've not benefited. Uh, the dirt is still out regarding MRA antagonists in half-bath and their ongoing trials to address this. But overall, um, spironolactone has not decreased cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization composite in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Similar to the RAS trials, subgroup analysis of the top cat trial that looked at mild reduce versus preserved has shown that mild reduced ejection fraction has benefited as compared with preserved ejection fraction. All right, so ARNI are one of the newer classes of medications. And the one medication that is available is Secubitril Valsartan. It was initially FDA approved for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction based on the landmark trial Paradigm HF. So Paragon HF was a parallel trial in patients with reduced, was preserved or mild reduced ejection fraction. And uh, this trial utilized a composite of total heart failure hospitalization as opposed to the first heart failure hospitalization and also included cardiovascular death as conventional for heart failure trials. And unfortunately, it missed its primary point by a narrow margin. So the p-value was 0 0.06, it was very close. Uh, but it was very interesting that in this trial, there were two pre-specified subgroup analyses that were very intriguing. So one of the subgroup analyses was looking at ejection fraction above or below the median for that trial, and that happened to be 57%. And as you could see here from this spline analysis, showing ejection fraction versus the rate ratio for benefit. So rate ratio less than one, meaning less cardiovascular um, death and heart failure hospitalization. And you, you see here nicely the benefit extends to an LVF that's approximately 57% but at higher ejection fraction, we lose this benefit as a confidence interval crosses one. The other subgroup analysis was women versus men, and this was fascinating. You could see the same spline across ejection fraction ranges that's showing that women actually benefited more compared with men. And there was also interaction between sex and ejection fraction. Whereas if you look at men only, the benefit extends to an LVF of approximately 45%, whereas in women, they tend to drive benefit up to an LVF between 60 and 65%. So these results are very intriguing. However, this was not the pre-specified primary analysis for the clinical trial. Nonetheless, this has led to FDA approval or extended approval of Secubitril Valsartan for patients with heart failure and ejection fraction below normal. This number was left up to the clinician's discretion uh, and deciding for themselves what that means for the patient that they're being treated. It's also worth noting that the Paragon trial, as opposed to the earlier RAS trials, have used an active comparator. So Secubitril Valsartan was compared to Valsartan and not placebo. So in totality, there is more evidence for Secubitril Valsartan in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as compared with conventional angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. The newest class of medication to be tested in pivotal trials in heart failure with preserved and mild reduced ejection fraction is SGLT2 inhibitors. And it was tested in two landmark trials, Deliver HF and Imper Preserved. So they both included a very large number of patients, um, <coughs> over 5,000 patients total an LVF of over 40% and NYHA class two to four. The primary composites were very similar. For Imper preserved, it was heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death, whereas for Deliver HF, it was 
worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death. So for these trials, they have shown really outstanding results as far as showing positive effect of treatment versus placebo. And you can see that the results are very similar in the trial with a hazard ratio of about 0.8. So 20% reduction in the composite of cardiovascular death and worsening heart failure or heart failure hospitalization and getting very consistent. I would also like to draw your attention to the separation of the curves very early on. So the benefit of these medications um, starts immediately when patients receive medications. So as GLT-T2 inhibitors have decreased the composite of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization in patients with HFPEF. This was mainly driven by reduction in heart failure hospitalization and not cardiovascular death. And um, when this was looked at at meta-analysis, it's shown favorable effects for cardiovascular death as well, but not as pre-specified in the primary endpoint of the trial. So putting everything together that we talked about so far for management of heart failure with milder reduce and preserved ejection fraction. So this is looking at um, sacubitrofal sartan, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, and SGLTT2 inhibitors. And you could see that the benefit extends to an LV ejection fraction of approximately 60%. And above that, we do lose that benefit. And this is telling us that perhaps patients with mild or reduced ejection fraction drive similar benefit from these three classes of medications as compared with patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and also patients with half bev on the lower end of ejection fraction spectra. What about beta blocker? Beta blockers are foundation for treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Unfortunately, we have very limited data in the space with mild or reduced and preserved. This is a retrospective propensity match analysis that looked at a very large database, over 400,000 patients over age 65%. And they found that uh, patients with preserved ejection fraction, they don't benefit from beta blocker use, and this may actually be associated with more events, whereas patients with mild or reduced ejection fraction do have benefit from beta blockers comparable to patients with reduced ejection fraction. And they sort of came up with this recommendation to utilize beta blockers in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction for additional indications such as atrial fibrillation or secondary prevention of MI. And this is because there are some adverse effects from beta blocker use in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and that has to do with chronotropic incompetence and limited exercise capacity. In fact, there have been some data showing that withdrawal of beta blocker may be associated with improved exercise capacity in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So putting everything together and uh, looking at the guidelines that Dr. Boskert has co-chaired, on the right side, you'll see treatment of half buff diuretics are class one, Highest class of recommendation is SGLT2 inhibitor with a 2A because of the evidence that we're having. And likely this is going to move to a class one recommendation in the next iteration of the guidelines. And it has already moved to class one in the European guidelines, followed by ARNI, MRAs, and ARPS as a class 2B. On the left-hand side, you will see that treatment of heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction is very similar to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, except that we don't have as robust of evidence. So it's diuretics, SGLT2 inhibitors, ACE ARNI, MRA antagonists, and evidence-based beta blockers. An important aspect, as Dr. Boskert has mentioned, is management of comorbidities in half bath. Patients with half bath have significant comorbidity burden um, they have excessive and dysfunctional adipose tissue. They have cardio, kidney, hepatic, metabolic diseases. 
they're hypertensive, diabetic, they also have systemic, non-cardiovascular comorbidities such as anemia, sleep apnea, pulmonary disease, and they do have often concomitant cardiovascular comorbidities such as atrial fibrillation or coronary artery disease. There's a lot of excitement around the newer uh, obesity pharmacologic medications with the GLB-1 agonist. There's some prelim data as well in heart failure with preserved dejection fraction, but obesity remains a highly prevalent comorbidity in heart failure with preserved and mildly reduced ejection fraction and is a target of therapy and management of obesity is associated with improvement in comorbidity burden and in outcomes. So very recently, GLB-1 have been studied in a relatively small trial in heart failure with preserved dejection fraction step half buff. The primary endpoint for this trial was not um, heart outcomes such as hospitalization and mortality composite, but it looked at quality of life, which is very important to our patients and to us, and also change in body weight. And this trial was positive. It's shown significant improvement in quality of life measured by the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. And this was parallel to the reduction of weight that's seen. Um, there is more to come on GLB-1 agonist in heart failure was preserved ejection fraction, but this is potentially the next class of medication for this patient population. In conclusion, heart failure was mildly reduced ejection fraction benefit from quadruple therapy uh, that's comparable to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. However, evidence is limited. SGLT2 inhibitor is the first class of medication to show benefit in heart failure was preserved and across the range of ejection fraction. The higher the ejection fraction, the greater contribution of non-cardiac comorbidities in heart failure and lack of response to guideline-directed therapies. And finally, weight loss interventions improve quality of life in heart failure with preserved ejection fractions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that was quite the whirlwind review of medical management. Certainly lots of updates uh, over the last couple of years, maybe even the decade. Uh, some of us have been out of med school for a little bit, so this is a great update for us. I think there's a couple of questions from the audience members, and I am going to sort of pull in our other panelists, Dr. Diakos and Dr. Brown, because um, I think this is, some of these questions are also following up from both of your previous grand rounds. And I want to first ask this question around BNP. So when we think about BNP, and this is really in the diagnostic portion and not so much the medical management per se, but when we think about BNP with preserved EF, should you use BNP as a marker or should you use more symptoms? How do you guys go about thinking about this in a patient coming in to your ambulatory practice in the community? So I guess I'll go to Dr. Diakos and Dr. Brown, and then I'll circle back with Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Bosker. Um, uh, thank you very much. So yeah, I, I see, you know, if there's a patient walking in my clinic that has a uh, shortness of breath, uh, yes, uh, uh, I, I see, uh, you know, the first is history, uh, to take history when the shortness of breath is happening, um, uh, how often, in what settings. Um, then, of course, physical exam. You want to examine and see his jugular veins, if they're distended. You want to uh, listen to the lungs and see if they have crackles or not. And then chest X-ray and BNP, I would say, these are like uh, part of my basic uh, workup. Now, if I do have suspicion that the patient has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and, uh, uh, you know, the patient uh, is uh, on physical exam uh, and, and, and X-ray uh, shows uh, signs of heart failure, but the BNP is not elevated. We have to keep in mind there are some conditions like obesity uh, that uh, it may give you falsely low uh, BNP. Um, so uh, I'm not going to say, oh, the BNP is down. This patient is not having heart failure for sure. I'm not going to start treatment or diuresis. Uh, but, you know, an elevated BNP is, is, is really part of my initial workup. Dr. Brown, do you want to add anything to that? I find that BNP is often confirmatory with what our clinical uh, signs show us. And, and like Dr. Dyko said, I think if you have a patient who's manifesting clinical evidence of volume overload, 
and, and heart failure, and then you get a low BNP in labs, you're not going to treat them differently. And if you get a high one, you're going to say, oh, yes, that's what I thought. Okay, great. I could add to that as well. Yeah, so far. So detection of natriuretic peptides is a class one recommendation in patients in whom there is suspicion of heart failure or they have signs or symptoms compatible. Uh, bear in mind about 25 to 30% of patients with HFPF may have normal natriuretic peptide levels, but they do have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Particularly, these are patients who are obese, patients who have androgen resistance, insulin resistance, so you have to pay attention to that. So do not rule it out if the patients still have symptoms and or signs. I have right. two comments. Yes. In patients with heart failure with preserved, it is not a rule out test. Or diagnosis. So yes, because of the comorbidities, we do see a variety of patients with obesity where the levels may look normal. In those individuals, one will need to utilize other maybe objective markers such as left atrial dimension, uh, as well as elevated filling pressures by imaging, along with the x-ray and the uh, symptoms and signs Dr. Dracos mentioned. For heart failure with reduced CF, it's a good, good rule out in the ER, and it's a good differentiator. So in the diagnostic realm, when the pretest likelihood is 50-50, a patient coming in with COPD CHF, right, in the ER, and you don't know which one it is, it's a good differentiator. So this is for the diagnostic rule-in, rule-out concept. The other thing is prognostication. So at the individual patient level, both the trajectories of what happens to BNP as well as the magnitude of the elevation is prognostic. And we do know this, and we have a class two recommendation, the guidelines saying obtain not only a baseline, but also a pre-discharge BNP for hospitalized to see which way the patient is going. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend a follow-up BNP? So let's say I'm a primary care country doc uh, practicing in rural New Jersey right now. Um, would you recommend that I repeat the BNP? Let's say the patient's been out of the hospital now two weeks. They're doing fairly good. They're well controlled. They're feeling great. Symptoms are minimal. Do we repeat it or do we not the, repeat it? What is your recommendation? The recommendation currently in the guidelines, I'm going to quote what the guidelines say, then I will state what I do. Um, it is a class two recommendation of a pre-discharge. So we always obtain baseline. That's a class one recommendation. Hospitalized or ambulatory, you need a baseline. And then there is evidence that obtaining another one pre-discharge gives you an idea of how closely to monitor where this patient is, whether this patient is refractory or not. Responsiveness to therapy matters, meaning you could either assess that with symptom signs, but at the same time, uh, how often do we assess and how precise is our symptom signs? Everybody's symptoms within four hours of hospitalization improve. This may improve uh, overall, you know, the things that bring them to the hospital, except for the JVD and the edema, the signs, everything improves from the subjective. So thus, we will need to have some objective marker. Otherwise, um, it would be potentially a black box of not knowing which patient, which way this patient is going. This, the, also, the inertia is a critical concept because patients who are NYHA class two are not to be termed stable. We don't want the terminology stable to be used. If they're symptomatic, it's like active cancer. So this is like calling active cancer, stable cancer. So if somebody is symptomatic, this patient really needs further optimization of therapies. Great, okay. And, and yes, we do recommend a pre-discharge, but in ambulatory setting, there's not been a study demonstrating repeated BNPs mm -hmm. would be helpful. Right. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think the next question that was submitted by the audience, and it's something that I know a lot of us in the community often face, which is the affordability of some of these medications now, especially when we're thinking about heart failure. In this, in this setting, we're talking about heart failure, but just in general, some of the SGLT2s in particular have been very difficult for our other patients to be able to afford or even have access to due to low or shortages in frankly manufacturing. How do you guys go about thinking, I have a patient who needs ARNI, needs SGLT2 inhibitors, but they may or may not be able to afford. Are there other considerations or are there resources that you sort of tap into to help with that? 
So I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Bhaskar, and then I'll move right across the panel backwards. So Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Brown, and then Dr. Diaco. Um, the concepts are optimize despite the barriers, meaning coupons and calling and uh, negotiating with the uh, coverage insurance and making the case that this individual has the indication. The, this individual has the indication. Now, of course, I do recognize that when the copay is um, truly a prohibitive and or financial toxicity, the question was, which one of these shall I give? And I think in that context, individualized, for example, SGLT2 inhibitors are also a good decongestion. There are now evidence that these agents work well in the um, concept of both acute as well as chronic and individuals with CKD and individuals with probably a congestion profile. Um, you know, which one to start? For example, individuals with active ischemia, tachycardia, VT, VF, AFib with RVR, beta blockers may come first. But individuals who are congested, you're going to use diuretics and maybe SGLT2 inhibition first. Individuals with CKD, microalbuminuria, diabetes, maybe SGLT2 inhibition first. Individuals with NYHA class four, that may be an ACE inhibitor, not ARNI. So these kind of I guess individualizations may help the individuals to select which one do I start first. And I don't want to have that framework of, ah, I do like this one um, superior to the other. My answer is individualization. But do keep in mind, um, some of these agents are going to become generic in about a year and a half, two years, uh, SGLT2 inhibition and others. So in essence, we should not have the perception that these are not going to be affordable. And there's also variability in uh, payers and uh, having the social worker and the navigators to create the advocacy for the patient's behalf is important. Social determinants of health are important. Educating the patient is important. This is very much similar to what the cancer physicians do. We would not give you know, partial chemotherapy to a cancer patient just because the copay is high. Dr. Okay. Mohammed, you, you have thoughts Absolutely. you want to add? Absolutely. Yeah, I would second what Dr. Boskert has said, and I think this is part of a bigger problem of access to heart failure care. Prescription drug is a major issue, and this has to do with multiple levels. So starting from policy, uh, payers, patients, and providers, including healthcare system, as well as clinician. So to basically implement a big change, policy has to change. And we're looking forward to see the prescription drug coverage provision of the Inflation Reduction Act. That's gonna be very important to our patient to basically make restriction on medication cost. And also payers have to cover medications while they are on patent. This is extremely critical. We are doing a lot of efforts as clinicians in our heart failure clinic, but that will remain limited unless there are changes in policy and changes in pair systems. Sure. Great. Um, I can talk about the IR, the Inter Inflation Reduction Act, all day. I'm going to spare you guys. Um, I'm a little bit of a policy nerd, so I'm going to move right past that because that's a trap for me. <laughs> so we're not going to go down that road, but agreed with you. I think policy at the national level needs to change and that negotiations or price reduction of these costs, um, medications needs to be addressed. Dr. Brown, I'm thinking about you as I think about who I refer these patients to, who's my colleague down the road and at the seven farms that I pass when I'm driving. <laughs> Tell me, how do you think about it? So I think going back to like what Dr. Boskert said, it's it's not necessarily a cookbook. Um, we do have a lot of evidence for all of these agents, but it depends on the patient's profile in particular. I'd say in my practice, you know, an ambulatory setting, luckily things like evidence-based beta blockers and MRAs are generic. I have had a lot of success with the manufacturers uh, for SGLT2s and ARNI doing patient assistance. It just requires a lot of paperwork. And even in Medicare patients, I have been able to achieve this. So knowing that that resource is out there and you can apply for that um, through the manufacturer is very helpful, but it's it's patient to patient. And, and yeah, we live in the real world and a lot of these patients, they need for drug regimen, but they can't necessarily afford all of it. So you have to see where they are in their spectrum and what their comorbidities are to decide uh, which ones are top priority. Last comments, Dr. Diakos, what do you think? How should we solve this problem? Uh, I 
Yeah, I, I think I think uh, I also uh, do individualized care uh, for my patients. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is uh, what Dr. Brown said that people, uh, patients do not know always what are the pathways they can go through. So, for example, it's very important what she said about uh, patient assistance through the company. So it requires paperwork. I, I've been doing it a lot, uh, uh, but but that's something we can educate patients about that, and not all, everybody knows. And most of the times they go to a pharmacy and. Uh, uh, they call you next day and say, hey, they told me and it's like 90 bucks. I'm not going to be paying 90 bucks a month for one pill. Um, and, you know, you have to kind of navigate the system. Sometimes I tell them I kind of flip around the SGLT2s. I don't know, for some reason, some insurances, you know, uh, you know, cover more of one of, uh, versus the other. So, um, you know, these are kind of tricks that I've been trying to do. Great. So one of the things I've learned from this panel is A, um, keep up with that paperwork. It's worth it when it comes to copay assistance. And then a policy change and advocacy is key. As you mentioned, Dr. Mohammed, that it's going to need a lot of movement from all different directions. Dr. Greensberg, I wanted to pull you into this conversation because I know that this is a particularly of interest to you when it comes to access, whether it's to our specialty heart failure centers for our patients or whether it's medications. I wanted to give you a chance to share some wise words with us on where you think this is going to go. Well, I, uh, the first thing I want to say is thank you to everyone. This is, it, uh, we, we have had several conversations and sessions with regard to heart failure. And uh, I, I think um, I was thinking during this talk, I'm sort of getting it. <laughs> and I think it's, you know, it's it's complex. And if you don't do it every day and keeping these things straight, um, uh, it is a, a challenge, particularly for uh, folks who have practices that are very broad and heart failure is a small piece. How do you keep this straight? So thank you um, for a very clear and um, I think insightful conversation. So that's number one. Access is an issue. Uh, I've, I've just finished a book. Uh, that talks about um, kind of what Dr. Diakos was talking about, the pharmaceutical companies and, uh, pet, you know, they they have these huge fees and then they say, oh, yes, but we have a patient assistance program. So um, it's it's challenging. And, and of course, we have our underserved patients uh, that makes it even more challenging. And so I, I don't know that I have the answer, but um, it is on people's mind. It's certainly on the minds of folks of Common Spirit um, and, and one that we are working on to solve. So I, I wish I had a better answer. The, the other thing I would say is, is that not for heart failure, but for some of our other more common illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, uh, we actually, as we are looking at our effectiveness data, how we are doing and managing those patients, uh, we are now also starting to look at um, ethnicity uh, and race uh, and, and to look at how are we doing for patients who are in the minority uh, and specifically, what can we do to reach out to those folks? And I think that will happen um, as the data gets better with heart failure. But there's a lot of work in this space um, that I think is very encouraging and uh, that we'll follow up on in the next year. So I would say thank you to start. I'm gonna... I, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Boskert. Uh, if I could um, maybe um, share another strategy we all could take is the leveraging power of the health networks with payers mm -hmm. um, because we are the ones who are looking at the outcomes, lives saved um, and functional capacity and quality of life and thus can incorporate that in our negotiations with the payers um, and put that in the framework of value-based care. And in essence, as to what we could sit down and uh, negotiate these prices, could be scaled up and also can look at mm -hmm. what's happening between ages 25 and 64, not Medicare, as well as what's happening in rural health because the heat density maps of what's happening in the United States and zip codes is truly concerning. In the past, we used to just see higher mortality in South across the globe next to the equator because of the clustering of comorbid comorbidities. Now the heat maps for death, mortality for cardiovascular and other diseases in zip codes and rural 
And I know Common Spirit Health and others are looking mm -hmm. into that. And it's on us for us to be able to come up with the formulations of affordability and access. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, we we tend to look at it in terms of what we purchase for our inpatient facilities and so forth. And there's lots of negotiations around that. And frankly, even for our own employees, of which there are many, um, how, how do we do that? Uh, but I think it's when the patient sort of goes back to their neighborhood pharmacist uh, that we get into trouble or they get into trouble. And so I, I think that's another area that we could certainly start to look at. Fantastic. So I, well, yeah, I think this is a great way to wrap up our grand rounds for this morning. So thank you again to all of you. Gary, I'll give you the last word. Oh, uh, it's it's always thank you. Um, there's a lot of time and effort that behind the scenes uh, from Rachel and John and the team, uh, the planning team, Dr. Sagar. We are actually formalizing our uh, CMA work and we'll have a, uh, a CME committee in place uh, probably next month. Is that right, Ankita? Um, uh, but to our speakers, uh, many of whom are return visitors, we are forever grateful. And I would just say it really adds sort of substance to who we are um, and sort of creates that sense um, that we're working on this together. And so we thank you very much. It, it's a great morning and I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm learning as we go, which is great. So thank you.